Hare Krishna everyone. So today in this Bhagavad Gita session, we're going to look at chapter 9, verse verse 2, which goes, Rajavidya Rajaguhyam Pavitram Idam Uttamam Pratyakshavagamam Dharmyam Susukham Kartum Afyayam English translation. This knowledge is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. It is the purest knowledge, and because it gains direct perception of the self by realization, it is the perfection of religion. It is everlasting, and it is joyfully performed. Right. So we're going to look at a brief explanation and after that we'll go into more detail. <coughs> Excuse me. So Krishna says here that this knowledge is the king of education, the most secret of all secrets. So he is referring here to the knowledge that he gave to Arjuna in chapter 9 of the Bhagavad Gita. So we know there are 18 chapters in the Bhagavad Gita and the pearl, the great gem, the king of education is found in the middle of the Bhagavad Gita, well protected, well hidden. Um, it's found in chapter 9. So what he means by this, the secret of all secrets, king of education, is that chapter 9 is the essence of all knowledge that can be derived from the study of the Vedas and different kinds of philosophy. Um, even in the previous chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna, um, he gave us um, some knowledge there. So remember the, the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita first chapter is more or less an introduction to the rest of the book. And in the second and third chapters, spiritual knowledge described there is called confidential. Um, topics discussed in the seventh and the eighth chapters are specifically related to devotional service. And because they bring enlightenment in Krishna consciousness, they are called more confidential. So we're building up to the most confidential knowledge here, which is situated in chapter 9. So matters described in the ninth chapter of the Bhagavad Gita deal with unalloyed, pure devotion. Therefore, this is called the most confidential. Um, so... So basically, the essence of all knowledge is there in chapter 9. Um, so basically, this chapter 9 there is about devotional service. Devotional service is the, it's the highest. It's Pakti Yoga. It's Pakt, the science of Pakti is a very um, potent science because by this we can win over Krishna. Um, we can, um, Krishna, he, he, he is, um, he's very pleased with his devotee and he, he, he reciprocates, he even accepts to become subordinate to his devotee, um, who practices Pakta Yoga, who gives, uh, gives him pure love and devotion. Um, Krishna is said to be Rasa Raj, so he is the one who enjoys different races, he enjoys loving service with his devotees. Um, so, so this chapter, it shows um, that um, basically it's about devotional service and the purifying potency of devotional service is very strong. It's so strong that it burns all sinful reactions that we may have in um, acquired for our, our millions of lifetimes, it burns away all the sinful reactions. So, um, so an example here about the confidentiality is is given um, where you have a high court judge and he may be going to work, so he sits in the court wearing his suit and looking very stern and uh, not really joking and you know, uh, is not very intimate with, with his surroundings. 
Um, but when he goes home, he changes into maybe his shorts. He he's not as strict. He's engaged in loving exchanges with his family. He may have a child. He may go on all fours, um, put his child on his back, and play horse. He he is intimate with his family members. Um, so this intimacy in relationships, this love, this loving exchange that the Lord, the Supreme Lord has in his Goloka Vrindavan planet, which is his spiritual planet, that intimacy which is there, that's, that's very confidential. Not everyone can know about it. Only those with love and devotion to him can experience this loving exchange with the Lord. <coughs> so it's confidential. Um, it's, it's the most secret of all secrets. If one is simply engaged in acts of devotional service, everything is revealed to him automatically by Krishna, and he can understand it. So that's the meaning of direct perception of the self by realization. It means everything is um, directly perceived because Krishna is in the heart of every living entity and when he says the sincerity with which the um, living entity is trying to serve him he sees the love and the devotion he automatically enlightens that devotee so devotee acquires all knowledge automatically and and then can understand krishna better even if that person may not be knowing anything at all about the scriptures krishna in his heart will automatically give him this knowledge by which he can understand things um, and he can uh, so everything is revealed to him by Krishna um, it is the perfection of religion so this knowledge is the perfection of religion what is the perfection of religion it's the attainment of devotional service there are so many different religions different paths to to god and um, to um, realize self-realization and the perfection of, of of all those religions is to acquire love for god love of godhead um, where we, we become detached from this material world and we only want to um, <coughs> love God and, and all his living entities, all the living entities he's created. Devotional service continues even after liberation. So it is everlasting, which means that even if a devotee has got liberated from the cycle of birth and death, has gone back to Godhead, back to the spiritual planet he's not just sitting doing nothing and thinking yeah i've achieved my goal so now i can relax i can enjoy myself that's not what a devotee does even in in the kingdom of god a devotee is engaged there in serving the supreme lord because the devotee relishes that's the greatest happiness for a devotee is to serve the lord with love so it's everlasting continues even after liberation and it is joyfully performed so the process of devotional service <coughs> is it's a very nice one it's it's executed in a happy mood without much difficulty everyone likes to um, perform devotional service So let's see the first slide. So first is we want to know what the qualification is to receive this most secret of all secrets. So we can get that an idea from the um, Bhagavad Gita. First, very first verse of the Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Personality of God had said, My dear Arjun, because you are never envious of me, I shall impart to you this most confidential knowledge and realization, knowing which you shall be relieved of the miseries of material existence. And then he goes on to say in Bhagavad Gita 9.3, those who are not faithful in this devotional service cannot attain me, O conqueror of enemies. Therefore, they return to the path of birth and death in this material world and somewhere else 
it is mentioned, um, Christian mentions, only to those great souls who have implicit faith in both the Lord and the spiritual master are all the imports of the Vedic knowledge automatically revealed. So we see faith is a very important um, qualification that we need in order to receive. For, so the definition of faith is the complete conviction that simply by serving the Supreme Lord Sri Krishna one can achieve all perfection according to the Chaitanya Charitamrita. Um, so we can see we do need to have faith in Krishna and the only reason why um, um, we, we need to have faith and we should not be envious of Krishna as well. So we see in the very first verse of this confidential chapter 9, most confidential chapter 9, Krishna says, only because you are not envious of me. So those who are envying the Supreme Lord, so who are those who envy? Those people who try to um, say bad things about the Lord, who don't like the Lord, who offends his devotees, who offend, say offensive statements about the Lord, who do not cannot stand hearing glorification of the Lord. These are envious people who want to stop the propagation of of um, the holy chanting of the holy name, want to stop um, Krishna consciousness. These are envious people. So Krishna says, because you are never envious, I shall impart. So Krishna does not um, reveal himself to people who have no faith or who are envious. So in order to receive this instruction, the instructions of this most confidential chapter, we need to have faith in Krishna and his instructions. And faith as it is, is a most important factor for progress in Krishna consciousness. Because it makes sense, if we don't have faith, we're not going to believe what Krishna says there in the Bhagavad Gita, and we'll just discard it as um, rubbish, or uh, we'll just say, well, we don't believe anything of that. We'll try to put forward our own arguments, our own concoctions, our own speculations. So, therefore, um, the big question then is how how do we acquire faith? Faith is created by associating with devotees. So, um, it's so important to associate with devotees who already have this very firm faith, who are in a very good consciousness, who have given up um given our bad habits we're not associating with material energy anymore they they simply focused on the lotus feet of the lord so by associating with these kind of devotees we develop faith right so now we're going to look at how devotional service or bhakti yoga um it burns sinful reactions so um <coughs> so for those who are engaged <coughs> excuse me for those who are engaged in the devotional service of the supreme personality of godhead all sinful reactions whether fructified in the stock or in the form of a seed gradually vanish so we have been committing a lot of sinful react sinful activities throughout our different lifetimes and even in this lifetime knowingly or unknowingly we're committing sinful activities now these sinful activities we don't um of, of course they provide that they, they produce fruits so we have to suffer because of these sinful reactions we have to suffer from pain or distress even if we've stopped performing sinful reactions we still have to suffer um so for instance when we are saying we're, we're sowing the seeds of a particular tree the tree does not appear immediately to grow it takes some time if it's first it's a um, small sprouting plant then it assumes the bigger form the form of a tree and then it bears flowers and fruits and when it's complete the flowers and fruits are enjoyed by persons who have sown the seed of the tree. Similarly, 
um, a man performs a sinful act, and, and like I said, it takes time to fructify. So in the meantime, we can we can see that say sinful people, right? Um, we may see around us in our environment that some people are really, really sinful, but, and yet they're they enjoying life. They seem to uh, to be very happy in their life, and some people are only doing good things, but they are constantly assailed by all kinds of misfortunes. So sometimes we may question this: um, what's gone wrong? Is it the law of material nature has has gone wrong there? But no, it's just that there are different stages um, so some sins are still in the form of a seed and there are others which have already fructified and are giving us fruit which we're enjoying as distress and pain just a matter of time before we suffer from uh, a sinful reaction so the good news is that Pakti Yoga um, burns to ashes all these sinful reactions they gradually vanish which means we don't have to suffer from the the reactions but having said that it doesn't mean that we should continue to sin while practicing devotional service um, because that's not how it works let's take a look at the at the elephant so here we have an elephant bathing in the lake purifying his body but then, as soon as he goes on to the to the land, he starts to throw dust on his body, and he gets soiled again. So we shouldn't be like that. <coughs> we should not continue to sin while chanting the holy name, um, because actually um, maintaining material attachments and carrying out sinful activities against the regulative principles of bhakti yoga it's it's actually it's like committing offenses to the holy name it's one of the offenses to the holy name so we will not get the results of bhakti if we do that so here is a very nice story of the boatman and the scholar um so I'll begin with the story. So once there was um, a very um, intelligent scholarly person who who needed to cross a river and so he waited on the river bank and soon enough a boatman came along with his boat. He um, requested the man to hop in so he could, you know, um, so he could row him to the other end. Of course, the boatman, that, that was him doing his job. So as they sat there, um, going across the river, the scholarly person asked the boat, boatman, So tell me, do you know how the stars are formed and the planets? Do you know astronomy? So he was just trying to make conversation with the boatman. The boatman said, No, no, sir, sorry, I am... Uh, I'm just an illiterate person. I I just my job is to row people to row people across the river. I don't know much. I haven't been to school. So he continued rowing and then um shortly after the scholarly person said, "Okay, well, do you know anything about geography? Do you know how um this this river is formed and the rocks and land again the scholarly person said um, no I don't know anything at all and I haven't been to school so initially I forgot to mention the scholarly person said well if you don't know astronomy you wasted 25 percent of your life and now he says you've wasted 50 percent of your life you don't know astronomy you don't know geography um the, the boatman didn't say anything he was a humble person he was you know he, he hadn't been to school so it wasn't something to be ashamed of he didn't say a single word so then as they were moving across the riverbank, some dark clouds started to gather above. Um, it grew very dark, the wind picked up, 
and the rumble of thunder could be heard. So the boatman then said, my dear sir, could I ask you a question? The scholar said, all right, go on, go ahead. And the boatman said, do you know how to swim? The scholar said, no, no, I've never learned. There was never a need to know that. The boatman then said, well, sir, I'm sorry to inform you, but very soon there'll be a storm and um, the boat will capsize and you you should know how to swim because that's the only way you can save yourself. <coughs> so the, the scholar was... He was panicked. He didn't know what to do. And sure enough, um, there was a gust of wind and the boat capsized. The boatman, he knew how to swim, so he didn't have any trouble getting to the riverbank. But the scholar, he started to struggle. He couldn't swim. He couldn't. He, he started to drown and shouting for help. He couldn't um, swim. So this is a very powerful story. Um, it illustrates that all material knowledge we may acquire is going to be useless at the time of death. Because at the time of death, only one thing can help us. It's very important to know how to, how to cross safely to the spiritual world when our material body capsizes like the boat. So at that time, only Raja Vidya will help us. So um, this knowledge that Krishna gives to us, only that will help us. So we see the scholar was very knowledgeable, but he couldn't swim and he drowned. Um, whereas the boatman, he knew the essential knowledge that saved his life. So in this way, in this material world, we're bombarded with all kind of knowledge Um but we need to make sure that we acquire that most important knowledge that we need at the final exam of our life. Right, so we mentioned in the verse that um, this process is joyfully performed, which is true. Um, Pakta Yoga is the topmost of all yoga systems. Uh, you know, it, it can be performed by anyone, even children. Um, so it's a very simple process. Prabhupada gave us chanting, dancing, eating prasadam is not very difficult to do. Difficult thing to do, really. Um, in these pictures, we can see here on the left, Narad Muni was only five years old when he was at the ashram of these elevated Vaishnavas, and at this young tender age of five, he was practicing bhakti yoga. In the middle is Dhruv Maharaj who was at that time also a child. And we see Prahlad Maharaj also five years old. He was just a child and yet he was already practicing devotional service. So Srimad Bhagavatam says that one who is sufficiently intelligent should practice the activities of devotional service from the tender age of childhood. So when we say Bhakti Yoga, um, we've been talking about devotional service. So there are nine processes of Bhakti Yoga, nine um, categories, nine um, processes of serving Krishna's different ways. So the first is Shravanam, which is hearing about the glories of the Lord, his pastimes, his qualities, hearing his exchanges with his devotees, so we can hear... Um, Pajans also, he's, you know, um, prayers about him. We can hear that from um, devotees, from bona fide acharyas. That's Shravanam. Then we have Kirtanam. Kirtanam means chanting. So we're chanting the holy name of the Lord. We're chanting his glories. Um, right, so we're... we're singing we're actually singing so, so kirtanam kirtanam shramanam kirtanam smaranam means remembering the lord at all times padasavanam which means um worshiping the lotus feet to the lord archanam which means worshiping the archavigraha form of the lord so we know the lord he comes in the incarnation of 
deities and his deity form so we can serve him easily so doing deity worship aratis um that's archanam vandanam means offering prayers to the lord um dasyam being a servant of the lord like hanuman sakyam being a friend of the lord like arjun and Atma Nivedanam, where we surrender everything to him. Just like Bali Maharaj surrendered everything to Vamanadev, his wealth, his kingdom, his life, his body, everything. So here, I'm just going to uh, tell you a story about Arjuna Acharya. So Arjuna Acharya... He was a great devotee, a great Brahmin, and he was writing commentaries on the Bhagavad Gita. So as he was going through the Bhagavad Gita, he came to a shloka where Lord Krishna says that he carries what his devotees have and he preserves. So he, he carries what we lack and he preserves what we have. Um. We know the verse 9.22, where Krishna says, But those who always worship me with exclusive devotion, meditating on my transcendental form, to them I carry what they lack, and I preserve what they have. So, so there is this term, Vahamiham. So Arjuna, he could not understand why Krishna in this verse is saying, Vahamiham means, Vahami means, he personally takes care of his devotees. So Arjuna Acharya was thinking, how am I going to write a commentary for this? How am I going to explain this? Because I don't understand. Krishna is the Supreme Lord and Master. He's the, he, he has so many um, servants. He has so many associates. Everyone is worshipping him. Why does he himself have to come to his devotees to take care of them? personally he can send his associates for that he doesn't have to come himself and krishna is so powerful even by his thoughts he can make things happen automatically so he doesn't need to personally come so arjuna Chari was pondering on this now it was getting late um so on a daily basis he would go out to beg for alms um so he's a brahmin and every evening he would do that he'd go to um to the houses of the grihashtas um as per the vedic system and he would beg alms and the grihashtas would give him some rice or some vegetables some grains um some milk for his sustenance so every day he would do that but because he had been pondering that day on that verse he was late in 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 going door to door and that meant that he wouldn't be able to get anything because everyone would have already eaten by the time he reached their doors. Uh, at that time, Arjuna Acharya's wife was at home and um, she heard a knock on the door. She opened the door and she saw two beautiful children. One was um, bluish black in complexion and one was whitish. And the boys, they were like cowherd boys, and they said they they were actually holding a lot of groceries, very heavy groceries. So um, Arjuna Acharya's wife said, oh, who are you and why are you carrying such heavy loads? The boys said, oh, mother, we've been sent, we're disciples of Arjuna Acharya. Um, we've been sent with these, we've been sent here to give you these groceries. He sent us <coughs> to deliver these to you. So Arjuna Acharya's wife was surprised. He said, what? Um, you small children, how could you even carry this? And why did he send you? Um, the children said, we don't know, mother, but uh, we have to, we'll have to deliver these to you. Otherwise he will beat us. He will beat us with sticks. So, <laughs> um, the wife of Arjuna Acharya was shocked. She said, what? He will beat you? He beats children? She was really shocked. 
And the boys looked very fearful and they said, please, mother, take these. We have to go. And so they left. Uh, Jinnah Chari's wife was really perplexed. She made dinner that day, very sumptuous dinner with all the supplies. And so when her husband came back, he didn't have anything. He didn't get anything. He was surprised to see these opulent meals and he he inquired. Um, but before doing that, his wife scolded him and said, what, what are you doing? You are beating children now and you send those children with so many supplies that's not nice thing to do they're just little children um so Chino Chari was really shocked he said what well, I didn't send anyone I didn't send children what children I don't know who you're talking about and so he understood that those children were Krishna and Balaram and they had come personally to take care of his meals of he of his meal that that day because he had not got anything from the grihashtas and he would have had to fast that day but krishna by his mercy he brought personally he brought all these groceries for him so then uh, arjuna acharya understood that verse he went to his book his notebook where he had scribbled and he had cut out the Vahami bit where Krishna personally takes care of his devotees. Um, he, he saw that actually that bit which had which he had cut out, it wasn't there anymore. It had been um, rectified. So um, it wasn't cut out anymore. So he understood that, um, he understood the verse now that um, Krishna had showing him that he personally takes care of his devotees so that's a beautiful story and we're ending here but um this chapter on um chapter nine the most confidential knowledge um it's um it's it's a, a, a real gem um bhakti yoga is the topmost yoga that can save us uh, that can save us from death and help us go back to Godhead and it's happily performed it's easy in this age of Kali Yuga um, Lord Chaitanya himself has given us this this great way to perfect our life which is so simple it is said that the execution of devotional service is so perfect you can perceive the results directly um so it is, um, we have practical experience that anyone who is chanting the holy names of Krishna, Prabhupada says, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Ram Hare Hare. In the course of chanting without offenses, feel some transcendental pleasure and the person very quickly becomes purified of all material contamination. So, um, so yes, why not take up Pakti Yoga then and um, chant the glories of the Lord and, and chant the holy name. Hare Krishna. I'm going to end here. And um, if you like the video, please put a like and subscribe to the channel. Thank you.